This is Jean Moore with More Than Sports. Thank you so much for watching. I am so excited for my guest tonight, my first non-football player athlete. Um, so with me tonight is Miranda Fear the Maverick. So Miranda, thank you so much for being here. It's an honor. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. So you are now an, a UFC fighter. Mm -hmm. um, you just had your debut for the UFC, correct? Correct. Um, on Fight Island. Yes. And um, since I already brought that up, let's just talk about that fight because um, it's pretty spectacular. <laughs> uh, for your debut, talk to me a little bit about that fight and what happened. Uh, so went in there, had the best fight camp of my life to start out with, was in the best shape of my life. Obviously, it's my UFC debut, so it's my dream come true. I wanted to go in there and show my full potential up to this point, always learning, always room for improvement, but the best to where I was. Uh, so fight camp went good. It was the longest I ever had to prepare for a fight, which was nice. Usually I have five weeks or less notice. This time was longer than eight weeks, basically. Um, so I went into that camp just working hard, got there, felt confident, felt ready, um, kind of put the nervousness aside until Bruce Buffer called my name. That was a whole different story. Uh, went in there, and after a five-minute first round, I had busted her nose with a clean elbow. It was the third elbow strike I tried to throw. The third one cut her open, and the doctor ended up making it a stoppage in the middle of the first to second round. Um, I wish I would have gotten to put hands on her and get the TKO myself, but Hey, I got the money. I got the win. Uh, Dana was impressed and I got to come home with a pocket full of cash. <laughs> that's right. And you had a great debut. You know, I mean, that's you kind of showed the world who you were after that. Um, and I know that uh, when I reached out, you were kind of talking to other people as well about doing interviews. And so talk to me a little bit about what that's been like, you know, now that you've been back and now everybody kind of wants a piece of you because they saw your potential, you know, they saw what, what you can do. Well, a lot of that came from it being on fight Island, you know, it was the last card on fight Island, at least till 2021, the card was huge. It was the biggest one of 2020 for MMA as a whole, but definitely the UFC with everybody that was on the card. So I got a lot of exposure. A lot of people watched that fight. Um, and I did get to show who I was. I got to show a well-roundedness. I'm usually seen as this grappler and people talk about that's my strength. That's what I have. And I was able to go in there and show that I had a striking, you know, background too, and was able to use <laughs> that in the fight. Uh, but afterwards, of course, because it was such a good win, I just had tons of people reaching out for interviews. I'm pretty much booked the, since I got home till like late next week. And oh, wow. <laughs> like, people who are like, uh, sorry, I missed our interview. Can you schedule it for later tonight? I'm like, no, <laughs> no, I can't. Maybe two weeks from now. And they, of course, get frustrated, but you know, I well, got to sleep. <laughs> <laughs> now, let's. Um, talk a little bit about how it all started. Um, so how old were you when you started MMA? Uh, 18 years old. I started Brazilian Jiu Jitsu when I was almost 17 years old. So went to an actual gym, started training that, grew a passion for it within a couple weeks. I already knew some of the basics because uh, my dad had taught me a lot when I was young. Uh, but I had seen an amateur fight, and watched UFC a lot. I never really thought I was ever going to do MMA. But then I uh, just evolved over time. You know, I watched how not to insult, but how crappy the girls were in the amateur divisions. And I was just like, I can do better than that. And I don't even know how to fight. Like I've never put anybody in my life, but I know I can do better than that. <laughs> and uh, so went and did striking for like three weeks and had my debut as an amateur. And within a year turned pro uh, before I turned 19, which was the whole goal. And uh, Shannon Knapp, messaged me and I was like, yes, of course, I want to turn from um, and the rest is history. That's great. That's, you know, that's a good story. But you did wrestle when you were in high school. Yes. Now, people really explode that to be more of a story than what it is. <laughs> I'm trying to not be egotistical, but I literally wrestled for like three months. People are like, oh, she's an amazing wrestler, blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, no. Nah just compared to other girls, you know, not really on the large scale. I never really competed on the large scale, although I wish I would have had the opportunity. I think I would have been very successful, but I moved to a school my senior year that had wrestling. So I joined it. It was men's only team or boys, I guess. 
Um, competed for three months until I found out I was not going to college for that because my whole point in doing sports through high school was to get a free ride to college. Mm -hmm. um, academics ended up getting me wherever I wanted to go, basically. Um, and I found out I wasn't going for wrestling, so I just kind of quit in midseason. And I know quitters are losers, but I don't believe that adage. I think if you're not good at something or if it's not going to get you anywhere, there's no sense in wasting time when you have other dreams to go accomplish. Um, so I delved straight into jujitsu, kept up with the MMA stuff and did that instead of the wrestling. But I was a good wrestler. I think I ended the season 21 and two as a varsity. Wow. And I was also, I was uh, pretty good. Um, I probably would have went to state. So my coach was a little bit irritated, but <laughs> we lived like an hour away from school and, Mm -hmm. driving that far every single day and wasting gas money when I didn't have a job because I was doing sports was just not equating to success. Right. So what other sports did you play then? Uh, growing up, I played a lot of different sports. Like uh, even, you know, I joke about it, but when I was three years old, I was doing like gymnastics and my dad did arm wrestling with me, you know, so that was hilarious. And then um, did basketball, did track and field, cross country, um, and then just uh, the wrestling jujitsu started at uh, almost 17. I stuck with that. That was the thing that obviously I've been doing longer than any other sport. Um, mm -hmm. Going back to the wrestling, when I was at Drury University as an undergrad, I actually did wrestling, but I was only a member of that team for promotional purposes for the <laughs> Having a girl on your collegiate team, you know, is a pretty big deal. So it got a lot of media coverage, but I was already a professional fighter. So it was illegal for me to actually compete as a collegiate athlete. Um, so I would just train with the boys though. And I would say it helped my wrestling a ton. There's a huge difference between a college wrestler and a high school wrestler. And it got point after like a year of doing it. I was like, you guys are going to hurt me. I can't even train with you guys anymore. Like I could only do warm ups and do their strength and conditioning because they would just try to destroy me. And I was like, all right, I get it. You've wrestled since you're five and you're a lot bigger than me. Don't hurt me. So how do you think that really helped you with your MMA? You know, um, you're known as a grappler, you know, did, did that help you? Not so much the training wrestling, but the competing with boys definitely did. Um, and just the way I grew up within that environment where I'm the only girl in the environment. In MMA, you don't really get that many females in the gym, especially for me, like my level, I can't ever find female training partners that are really going to compete with me that are anywhere near where I live. So learning to train with guys and get used to that and just to toughen up, you know, we, we joke about it at the gym. It's like, I'm tough enough. We've already figured that out. Now let's work on the skill level when <laughs> someone tries to bully me, you know? Um, right. Yeah. Training with boys definitely uh, has made me a stronger athlete in general. Like I feel like I can manhandle any girl that I go against. I'm like, I give that all credit to my male training partners. I'm like, if I can manhandle you at 100 60 pounds that knows what he's doing, then I can manhandle the 125 pound girl I'm about to go against. Right, exactly. Well, and that's great experience. You know, I mean, it's true. If you, uh, if you're used to going against the guys that are a lot heavier then I mean, these girls will be a piece of cake. <laughs> um, so let's talk. So you were talking about your dad and how he kind of taught you. Was he in MMA or? Mm -hmm. He, he was just not. As a hobby. If he walked into a gym, you would assume that he was like a professional fighter or did jujitsu for years. Um, to be bragatory in a sense, he uh, he knows like so many things. He taught me my basics in jujitsu, and he lacks a little bit in technique. But um, out of anything, though, he's my mental coach now. You know, I've kind of superseded his um, technique knowledge base. Like I know way more than him now but he's still that person that knows who I am. You know, he knows the personality traits I bring into that cage. So he's always the one that corners me. He's always been super supportive. He's the one that got me into the sport. Like my first introduction to women's MMA was Ronda Rousey's first MMA fight in the UFC. Before mm -hmm. that, I had no idea women even fought. I didn't know that was a thing. I just watched the UFC and I was like, this is cool. But I was like, <laughs> That's not reality for me. I hadn't even considered that, you know. Um, I was 14 years old, I think. And dad was like, look at this. And I'm watching. And I was like, wow, this is so cool. Women fight too. And dad was like, you could do that. You could be champion of the world one day. You were raised for this. And I was like, no, I don't want to punch you <laughs> in the face. Like, crazy. And, you know, here I am. So it's kind of hilarious. That and the fact that I always, like, 
I was scolded. Like I was taught never to fight girls. Like, like I was raised like a boy in that sense. Like I was raised on a farm and stuff. So we already knew I was like a lot stronger than other kids. Like I would play with cousins and things and I would just hurt them on accident. Just play <laughs> and dad was like, if you ever fight a girl, I'm going to whoop your ass. You know, and I was like, okay. like, if it's a boy, go for it. But if it's a girl, restrain them. Don't hurt them. And so I think it's hilarious and ironic that now I literally fight girls for a living. Yeah, no kidding. So what does he think about it? I mean, it, does he have a hard time watching the fights? No. Or he's, he's all for it. Absolutely loves it. Um, I'm sure he would have a different um, aspect of it if I got hurt. But uh, this last fight, I think I got more bruises than I have ever gotten. And I wasn't hurt at all. Like, I just, I'm durable as a fighter. And I also have a technique where I usually just take them down, submit them. So I don't incur much damage. I don't do the whole thing on the feet for a reason. I don't see why getting punched in the face is for people. Um, this time I stayed standing. The first minute was a little rough for me. I started off at a rocky start. I think just a little bit of nervousness got to me. It was my UFC debut. Uh, but once I got my timing and everything down, I started dominating the fight and didn't really get clipped anymore. But he that was his first fight, not watching me fight or being in my corner. Um, it was in Abu Dhabi. He had, he didn't get his passport in time. Uh, so that was a little bit like different for us. He was the first person I called like a suit of the cage and got to the bed talking to him. Doctors are reviewing me. And of course they were they're like, put away your phone to like check you for concussions. And I was like, no, it's bad. <laughs> and, uh, he was just so excited, but I know he wished he would have been here. He, um, we always joke that he's like, I wish I had a controller, like a remote controller to play you like a video game because you don't listen to me. And, you know, he's like, you scare me. If I could go in there for you and take the edge. And I'm like, yeah. But, <laughs> you know, he's the biggest supporter I have. That's great. That's really great to have that in your corner. And like you said, you know, he knows you. He knows your personality. He can kind of ground you a little bit. Um, you know, he kind of knows you more than anybody else out there. He's the one that if I'm losing a round or something and the coaches come in, like, work on this, do this. He's like, no, you just do what you're supposed to do. And he'll like yell at me. And I'm like, okay, okay, just calm down. <laughs> now, have you had to fight somebody? This is something I always wonder when I'm watching UFC. Have you had to fight somebody that's a friend of yours, like that you're, that you're close with? And oh. how do you, if so, how do you separate that? Because I think that would be so hard to go in MMA as such a different sport. You're out to kind of destroy them. <laughs> so. well, I think, but I think for all people, and I can speak for a lot of the other girls that I've talked to about this subject, we conversate before and after the fights, even though people see us like, rah, rah, rah. Uh -huh. but I, for one, am usually pretty nice beforehand. And especially after, like, it's a respectful sport. Like you beat each other in the face, but then outside of the ring, you can be best friends. But I've never had a fight against someone that was a really close friend. Um, I've went against somebody that I've went against in the past and we became friends over like social, kept up with each other, became what you would consider friends. Um, one example is Victoria Leonardo. I fought her two times, um, beat her the first time. And then the second, um, I fought her in the Phoenix series tournament. And then Deanna Bennett was another one. She actually beat me in our first fight. And then I came back and redeemed myself um, in the tournament Phoenix series. But we both of those opponents and I knew each other and we were Respectful. Victoria and I were closer than Deanna and I, and we had literal breakfast together that morning. We cut together, not knowing we would be opponents at the tournament. And so we were the first opponents to get called up to fight each other. And we literally hugged each other and we were like, of course, like, of course this will happen. Um, but it's, it's nothing like we go in there and just fight each other as hard as we would if we didn't know each other at all. It may be different if it was like my sister or my best friend, you know, I might be like, Ooh, sorry, I didn't mean to, but I would still fight. You know, I'd just be painful about it every time that I hit them. Like right. I don't know what's up with the UFC, but uh, the Anderson Silva versus Uriah Hall, it's kind of that kind of thing. You know, it's like I have so much respect for you. I love you. Like, inspire me, but a fight's a fight. Right. <laughs> at the end of the day, it's competition. So yeah, at the end of the day, um, I'm trying to get my check and go home without getting hurt. <laughs> <laughs> now, is there a particular fighter that you have looked up to? 
Uh, there's several. Um, but one of the like goats of MMA, as they would consider him, that I always found inspirational, read his and everything else, is GSP, George St. Pierre. Um, so he was one of my favorite. Matt Hughes at the time, which ironically they were opponents several times, but they were both two of my favorites. Um, and now, like, Tatiana Suarez is one of the girls that's up and coming. I think she's out for injury still, but she's getting ready to come back. She's one of my favorite fighters to watch. And then uh, Rose Namajunas, Joanna, uh, Young Wele, like, all those girls are just amazing to watch fight and to, like, inspire my own learning from. Is it a little bit surreal to have watched some of these people, like, when you were younger? You know, like you said, Ronda Rousey. And then now you're, you know, Dana White, you're, you know, I mean, like meeting these people and being around them. And is that, is that kind of surreal for you? Um, it's more than surreal. Like it's hard to even explain to somebody who's not on the sport themselves or hasn't had that position in life, but I'm one of those, I'm still young, you know what I mean? And I'm having to mature out of it within a moment. Like I'm one of those people that wants to walk up to every fighter I meet with a t-shirt and ask them to sign it still. And I'm like, please, like, please sign it. Like, and then I have to take a step back and be like, I am one of these people. Like, what am I doing? People, times <laughs> it's not a big deal. And uh, my first Invicta, I looking up to people and ask them for their autographs and things as I'm getting ready to fight them. <laughs> like, and eventually, like, I had talks with my dad like a mental state I had to get out of because it's still really exciting. I met Bruce Buffer, John Anik, like the first day that I was out of quarantine in Vegas. And I was just like, oh, my God, like, this is happening. And the reality finally hit of all of it. And, uh, you know, it's like a, it is my dream. Um, so it's just adapting to that. But it's been amazing. Like it's an incredible experience. Um, there's no high like it. Uh, which is why getting beat is so low, like it's so defeating. It's the rawest sport there is, basically. So to be beat in literal mortal combat, so to speak, is pretty like intense emotionally. Well, and how amazing to be able to be living your dream. You know, I mean, it's not a lot of people get to really experience that. And so you're still young enough, which is amazing. You know, you're 23 years old, and so you're still able to have this whole lifetime ahead of you of competing and you know you're going to college to get your phd <laughs> so how do you let's talk about that a little bit because you train you help teach i think as well don't you at the college and mm -hmm. you're going to classes for your phd how do, how does that all work it doesn't <laughs> <laughs> i feel like every time people that I get more and more depressed. Um, uh, just like literally scheduling out everything. That's what I tell everybody. But also, it is hard. I don't wish it on my word. Me, like, um, it's hard to have, for instance, a relationship that's healthy when as busy as I am. Um, to have the life that a lot of people need for their mental health, and I do too. But I'm also good at ignoring it. Um, you know, being a psychology major and everything, it's like, I understand the theories that are making me feel the way I do. So I'm smart enough to overcome them, but I also still know I have the problems. <laughs> um, but like for, for school, like my teaching job literally takes 20 hours a week. Like it's almost mandatory that we have 20 hours, but it actually semester at least is taking me hours. I have like, I think it's 92 students and every week there's a paper and like four assignments do. So like, hours upon hours of just sitting down and grading papers, not to mention the meetings with that professor and any emails I have to reply to that kind of thing. That's just the teaching aspect. Then on the academic side, like I'm going to be late for turning in my thesis because obviously I have so many other things going on, which sucks, but I'll get it done eventually. So I have my thesis I'm working on. I have three classes I'm attending and one's in person still. And then, you know, in addition to having the classes, there's a lot of grad school work that people are just <laughs> Let's have three classes. I have five. I'm an undergrad, blah, blah, blah. I'm like, yes, but I also spend like 40 hours a week doing research and writing papers. Like this week I have, and this sounds crazy. Hopefully my professor doesn't listen to this. Um, tomorrow I have like a 20 page paper due and I've turned, I have done like four pages so far. And I'm just like praying, you know, that I can stay up tonight and uh, tomorrow. Um, but that's 
all the time. Like literally sleep is an issue. And today I skip training, but usually I at least go and train for three hours a day outside of fight camp and usually in fight camp hours to six hours. A day. So wow. a mess, not to mention training and trying to get my meal prep and eating. Like I'm like, I don't, I don't even know how it's, I look at my own schedule and I'm like, yeah, shit, I guess I'll just figure it out. <laughs> <laughs> and it seems to work okay. I mean, you're still you're still sitting here, so that's a good thing, yeah. <laughs> barely. But and you know what? People are inspired by it, so it keeps me going. <laughs> well, and you are on the East Coast, so it's actually um, almost ten thirty there now. Mm -hmm. Yeah, <laughs> that's crazy. So I'm in Oregon. So um, it's like kind of talking about the what's that? Thirty there. Right. It's what? Seven, yeah. 730. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so if you could fight anybody, who would it be? Hmm. Like anybody. Oh, oh, I got some people I don't like around here. I'm <laughs> kidding. Um, that one, like that's the ultimate goal right now. She is the worst in the division and um, people give me shit to clarify. Not right now. I don't want to fight her right now. I want to fight her once I get a little bit more skill development, get a little bit more experience, maybe four fights from now, um, maybe even three. But I want to work my way up the division. Within the next two years, I want a title shot. I want to be making my title shot, making my mark within this division within at least a year. Um, if I can get another fight early December, which is the goal, and then a couple more um, by the halfway point next year, like I plan on being very active. Um, at, at the very least, have four fights with, between now and uh, 2022. Um, so we'll see what happens, and hopefully I'll get to fight Valentina. Right now, I think the dream fight would be Caitlin Chikagian, um, but – She's pretty high up the rankings, and I don't see that giving it to me right away. But I'm so confident, like, I could win that fight. It's not even funny. Just um, the styles would clash. I have too good a grappling for her. And even though she has decent striking, she's so – she'd be really easy to take down and just kill on the ground. Mm -hmm. You have some pretty good goals. <laughs> and it seems like you, you know, you're very well-rounded, and you're very – um you know, for 23 years old, you know, this sounds kind of funny, but you're very mature and you know what you want and you're going to, you're going to get it, you know, and that's almost the attitude that you have to have, especially um, in athletics, you know, any sport you do, you have to believe that you can do it. Yeah, you have to believe, but also there's the people and I've seen so many fail at this sport and other sports, other aspects of life. It all works the same way. And it's mm -hmm. because you have these goals or dreams or whatever they want to call them, but they never like make a plan. They never sit down and write on a piece of paper, this date I'm doing this, this time I'm doing this, here's everything that's going to work towards my goal. Like my dad used to give me shit about my vision and be like, you shooting that, you should be looking this way. And I used to hate it. I was like, why are you so mean to me? I'm like, I'm fit. I've got muscles, blah, blah, blah. And he's like, yeah, but you're not doing the best you could do. This is a sport that you could literally get murdered in and you're not taking it serious enough. And until I'd say last year, I was just like, I'm doing fine. You know, like just the teenager in me or immaturity in me. I didn't like being told I'm not fit enough or healthy enough when I would compare myself to others and be like, I'm so much more fit than everyone I'm around. Um, and now I feel like I'm finally walking around 24 seven, looking like a professional athlete, training like a professional athlete every single day and working hard to get better. Mm -hmm. Well, and let's talk about that because you do look like a professional athlete. I told you this story actually, um, before we went live, um, mm -hmm. I saw you in the Denver airport and told my husband, she looks like a UFC fighter. And um, without really even knowing who you were or if you really were one or not, um, and then finding out that, of course, I was right. So, you know, you do hold yourself that way. And, and that's why it wasn't it wasn't the braids you had in the hair. It's how you it's how you carried yourself. Yeah, and you. so, um, you know, I could definitely tell. And so you definitely have that. And people will and do look up to you you know, because of that. Yeah. Thank and you. your attitude, you know, I, 
when I messaged you and said, you know, I saw you, you're like, well, you should have came up and saw me that that's the attitude that needs to um, really needs to stay in place for your whole career. You yeah. know, that humbleness and that, um, you know, just that caring about others. And I yeah. think that's such that's a true point. And that's something people are like, well, what made you love the sport? Like what makes you enjoy it? I think my big thing is not even specifically fans, but I guess they are fans, but it is that way, you know, like I don't, I don't even understand how someone can really get that celebrity attitude. And maybe I will as time goes on. But when I go up into the gym, I'm not special. We just got done talking about that at the gym. You know, my coach was like, I don't care if you fight. I don't care if you have experience. You listen to what I tell you. You stick to the basics. And not even if you're a UFC fighter, you know, I was like joking about me. But really, like, I don't. Why should I get treated any different just because I was given these God-given talents and chose a different dream than other people? If it was at their job, they'd be bossing me around. You know what I mean? This is just happens to be my job. That doesn't mean I get the right to treat people like shit because it's my job. Right. Um, like that little girl, and I don't know if you saw me post afterwards, but there was a little girl at the Denver airport who recognized me. And that was my first time ever having somebody come to me. And I've had people be like, are you in the UFC? Or like that's different but she was like you're the girl who hit her with the elbow you're Maria and Maverick and she just comes up to me and does that and I was like I am <laughs> and she went to take a picture and posted about it and then she was so excited when I reposted and everything like that's what I fight for or that's part of what I fight for like that is so inspiring for me to inspiring others like just that whole cycle is so um I don't know it's almost a spiritual thing about it that I value, you know, that, um, keeps me grounded as well. Yeah. Well, and I know that you are, um, somebody of faith. Uh, mm -hmm. I, I love your Proverbs 144 on your, on your, um, on your profile. Mm -hmm. Uh, I, I went and read that and that, that was pretty fitting, oh, cool. uh, <laughs> but that, you know, being somebody like that and understanding, like you said, these are your God given talents. You know, God, God gave you this for a reason mm -hmm. and to kind of pass that on to others, you know, like that little girl to really understand that these people look up to you and want to be like you. It's, it's empowering, you know, and to be able to impact people like that. Um, you know, I think that's one reason why we're all here is to impact others. And so, when you don't get humble, I feel like, um, and maybe God won't break you down. He doesn't everybody. Some, But some of us, some of us like get your head too big. And like I always keep in mind how many injuries I've had and how easy like boom, mm -hmm. my career is over. Like mm -hmm. go over. And you probably heard if you rewatch my fight and people didn't key in on it too much. Thank goodness. But I don't care now. It's public. I had both my retinas torn when I was supposed to make my debut back in June. Had no mm -hmm. idea had no symptoms of it, um, had never had my eye exam for the, my previous promotion I fought in. And the doctors were freaking out. The surgeons were freaking out. They were like two weeks and or one more plane ride. Your retinas would have been torn all the way out. Like you're 23 years old. You could be blind. Like there was a fairly high likelihood as far as percentages go that both eyes could have like, mm -hmm. and there was no, like both surgeons that I went to first were like, you're, you're done fighting. Like that's not even an option anymore. And my life was over for like two weeks. Mm -hmm. Absolutely just devastated. My dad was like, fighting is not you. That's not mm -hmm. who you are. You're Miranda, mm -hmm. not fear the maverick, you know, and separating my identity from this identity that I formed for myself over time and work for was so hard. But I think it drew me closer to God and made me more motivated now to realize how humble you really need to be, like how easy it is to have these dreams just boom, taken away if he so chooses to do so. My knee, I had it hurt before, same way. Like, I'm like, mm -hmm. if, if that gets me in, if that's all it takes and, and you're out for the rest of your life. So they're like, I'm the greatest, I'm the best out there, blah, blah, blah. I'm like, okay, like <laughs> you better be knocking mm -hmm. off wood somewhere and praying and just kidding this is for the entertainment purposes like you know. well and and that's really true i i talk a lot especially um to football players that i interview 
about that whole identity thing and and how you're so much bigger than the sport that you play like that's not like you said that's not who you are and i think that's such a big problem nowadays um, because of social media and just how sports are everywhere so if people see you that's how they identify you as well and that's kind of how how you're known and and like you know your identity and so it is hard you know if it does get taken away in a blink of an eye you need to know who you are as a person mm -hmm. and it's gonna hurt because that's what you love doing but really figuring out who you are aside from that you know and that's um that's something that i'm feel very strongly about mm -hmm. just because I think it is so prevalent that athletes get so caught up in that and the fans get so caught up in that. And so, um, you know, that's what I try to do is mm -hmm. get to know the athlete as a person and mm -hmm. try to humanize, you know, athletes a little bit just so people can see who they really are yeah, aside absolutely. from the sport they play. And another aspect of me having this debut was like, I've had a little bit of hate on social media before, but this time, oh my goodness, along with how many followers I got supporting me, I probably got half that many in hate. And unfortunately, they key in on negative things more than positive things. And it can really influence you mentally. Like, um, you know, it was just brutal. Some of the comments and like whole threads that were made about me and things. And I was just like, well, like, <laughs> I'm ugly, I'm this, I'm that, you know, and it was something that um, made me realize how much other athletes, I'm not even there yet, you know what I mean? I'm sure others have faced way more than that. And that's why people get mental coaches and things. Mm -hmm. And luckily, I feel like it's easy for me to kind of just shrug that off. But I don't know, there for a couple hours, I was like, oh, <laughs> just maybe more. I just can't read those. <laughs> Just don't read them because <laughs> that is hard. You know, I mean, that's, um, again, something about social media that's really a negative thing is that people feel like they can say whatever they want Absolutely. and not care about how it impacts anybody else. Yeah, there's no consequences for them, but it's kind of tying back to what you said. Like, you got to find yourself first, like, and mm -hmm. as long as you keep knowing yourself and having faith in yourself have that support system that i'm blessed to have like my family my friends my boyfriend mm -hmm. and, like the gym you know all these all these connections i have have um really uh grounded me and made it to where that stuff doesn't really affect me when it's nice to have people like that too you know that do they know you they know mm -hmm. the real miranda and right. they can help you validate who you are as a person and not what these people are saying on social media, right? Uh, because those people are inconsequential. Like they don't, they don't matter. <laughs> they don't know you, and mm -hmm. so with their opinions. You know, I had to kind of go through something like that because I interviewed somebody that was a little bit high profile that made some comments, and um, on like a month later after I interviewed them, and so you know, getting hate on the interviews, on the thread, you know, on, on Twitter. And so I hadn't had to deal with that, mm -hmm. but yeah, you just can't read them. Like you just can't worry about what other people say. And that's hard. <laughs> that's really, for me, that's difficult. Yeah. Now who has been your biggest well, you said your dad, but what's been your biggest motivation? And who's been your biggest, you know? That's definitely like, I'll just tie it right back to my dad for sure. You know, like even him not being there for this fight was almost more motivating for me because I was like, he can't think that him not being here is influencing my mental state. I've got to go out there and prove that I can do what I can do by myself, you know? And so it was kind of proving it to me, proving it to him. And I also like knew he was freaking out at home. You know what I mean? I'm like, ah, better get it over with fast. He's probably having a heart attack <laughs> right now, laying there with a heart monitor, like trying to stay alive. Um, but he's definitely my biggest, you know, motive. My whole family is not just my dad. Like, um, my mom, my stepmom support me. My brother and sister are watching me at all times, every time. Like, seeing me as this role model, basically, just like other people are. 
And um, I want to be able to make the most of like right now I'm away from home. Um, I'm a very big family person. And that's not only hard for me, but kind of like recognize the impact it's had on my family as well that we didn't necessarily know was going to be the case until I did move. And now I'm halfway across the United States, you know, so every time I go into that fight, it's to make that money uh, to invest back home and eventually get back home where my family is. That's great. So now let's kind of just a couple more questions. I know it's getting late for you, um, mm -hmm. but I kind of want to get to know more about you. Um, What's one of the biggest obstacles that you've had to overcome? Um, I thought about that when you asked me earlier, but I'd say one of them um, is just that uh, two of them would be the injuries. Um, just reconciling that in my mind and telling myself whether it's meant to be to keep an MMA or if that's a sign of quit, you're getting hurt, you're 23 years old, you don't need to be maimed by the time you're 40, you know. Um, so that was a challenge. And I finally just decided, you know what, these are just trials. And it's just going to make my story that much greater when I get to the top. Uh, that was my final decision on it. Who knows, it might change, but I can't imagine having just started to touch my dream. And then it just swiped away like that. And I feel like I live a good enough life. It just, it wasn't my time, you know, uh, to get out of the sport, not to die, but to get out of the sport. Yeah, yes. <laughs> to clarify that, that's not what I meant. Um, and then the other one, um, probably just the, the hate that I've faced on social media. Um, for whatever reason, I have had two opponents in a row now that are pretty um, girly girls, I guess you would say, like, posting on social media and in influencer type ways, especially um, the previous opponent to this one. And uh, as a result, me fighting them got me a lot of hate in my looks and things like that, just because I did not, I don't dress that way. I don't post that many things like that. Um, so me dealing with body image issues, I guess you would say, uh, was just frustrating more than anything. Like the fact that people say what they say and don't even like look or the fact that their fans will post like the worst picture they can absolutely find of me. And I'm like, that was when I was 18 and I was tired and sweaty after practice, like church. <laughs> yeah, <right. laughs> um, but yeah, those two things, you know, the, um, the hate on social media and then injuries. Now what's one thing <laughs> this is kind of a funny question, but um, what's one thing that you love to do outside of competing when you have time? <laughs> when I have time, I love the outdoors. Um, I love being outdoors, obviously going home and seeing my family and like playing on the family farm. That's the best um, going fishing or hiking with my brother and sister. But um, if I get time here, like right now, I love going on hikes. Mm -hmm. let's go for a hike let's go to the beach like whatever's outdoors that i can do and just spend time in the sun and join god's creation you know and now where do you live right now uh norfolk virginia okay and where are you from i am from springfield missouri okay okay mm -hmm. so from one i mean it's yeah. <laughs> at least you have the beach <laughs> Now, what's one little known fact about you? Hmm. <laughs> oh, you're twisting it up on me. Like they ask that at school, and so I tell them the fighting thing. Um, uh, probably, um, so I started my own art business at the age of 11, um, <laughs> and just recently have stopped doing it because of grad school has kind of kicked up. And so it's been a couple of years since I've done it, but I draw pencil sketches, um, realistic pencil sketches of people. I have like a little art page on Facebook and used to sell them. Like literally I was 11 years old. Like I think I made like three grand that year, like selling all wow. the people. Yeah. Like when you see an 11 year old kid that can draw a picture, like just like the look, it's like, Oh my God, here's money. Like, <laughs> I was selling them, you know, for like 30 bucks a pop and stuff, which was ridiculous. And eventually I started upping the price. My dad was like, all right, like you're getting good enough. Like that should be a hundred bucks. I'm like, okay. But um, yeah, I do that. And you know, when I'm old and gray and have enough time for it, which seems to be the only time I'll have, <laughs> hopefully I'll get back to that. I used to do it when I would like get emotional or just need some time alone, but I don't even have that time now. So, <laughs> um, Who, if you could meet anybody, so anybody, 
living or dead, who would that be and why? Interestingly, I had this question to get into grad school. They asked it and I had to write a paper over it. And it was the most frustrating thing I ever did. Um, I think, and this sounds crazy, but I think it would be my grandfather who I never got to meet on my dad's side. Um, he basically raised my father, um, taught him the morals my dad does have. And my dad's my favorite person. I'd love to hear things from his childhood from my grandpa's perspective. And uh, also just the history he knows, like he was in, you know, war. He, he like had that farm. He grew up like Great Depression era. I think it would just be amazing to get to talk to him and also like see my dad from that light. Mm -hmm. That's pretty cool. That would that would be that'd be pretty amazing. All right. Last question. Do you have any advice for others? So. Like what, what, what would be if you could ha give anybody any advice at all, what would it be? OK, so it applies to sports. It applies to life both at the same time. But um, if you have dreams and I hear it from all kinds of people, so that's why I'm going to do this one. Mm -hmm. You can't just have a dream. You know what I mean? People are like I have a dream and it's great big and this is what it is. You don't reach dreams by just dreaming. You know what I mean? And they also can't be impractical. Although mine seem far reaching, they were always within practical limits. I'm not setting the dream of being an NBA basketball player because I'm five foot three and a half. It's just not realistic. All right. I didn't set my goal to be an Olympic world record breaking mile runner because it's not realistic. But I did set my dream as something that I really did think could be realistic. And not only did I say that's my dream, but I set little bitty plans that worked my way up there. Like I built it brick by brick in my own mind. I envisioned it, wrote out that plan, made financial and life decisions that led me to that goal. You can't just be like, well, everybody else does it so I can get it too. Like you hear that all the time when people are like young and they're like, well, they're making it. They have a decent house and a car. So I can get that. It's not a big deal. I'm like, yeah. Did you think about them being in debt? Now they're 50 years old and that's how they have it. And, you know, like mm -hmm. that's all they ever made in life. And they're barely struggling along and they couldn't have a kid because they couldn't afford, <laughs> like, you know, all these things. And um, so when you have dreams, don't just say you have a dream. You've got to like, step foot, find a mentor, find a good person to advise you. It's not always your parents. Sometimes they're the worst people to go to. Uh, mm -hmm. Sad. Sometimes it's not even anybody, you know, um, reach out of your comfort zone. You know, I have little girls and people, I take it as almost, you know, I think I believe that everybody has a purpose. Mm -hmm. And one interesting thing I found about myself is I seem to be this person that people like to come and tell bad things to. Um, not, not about me, but like things that have happened yeah. in the and they want advice or help. And I'm like, I'm young. I'm, I'm inexperienced about a lot of these things, but I do find that I have these resources that can help them or that kind of thing. So find your person that's like that, you know, and, and go find them um, to be your counselor, be your advisor, or it could be a teacher at school. It could be some old librarian. Like, I don't know. It could be you on here. And <laughs> and you, and you, yep. on media, you know? Yeah, that's great advice. And that's true. You know, you can't just dream, you know, it, there's, you know, you have to put it in place. You can't yeah, just say, this cool. is what I want to do and wait for things to fall in your lap. Yeah. And um, the same way with being a Christian, like mm -hmm. you can't just expect God to help you and then blame God for you not getting somewhere. You know, you've got to meet him more than halfway. You got to work your butt off and mm -hmm. then other blessings will, will come to you, you know, like uh, one way or another. And sometimes they don't. And you have to learn to deal with that, too. And I feel like, if anything, it ends up being an example for somebody else. Or maybe somebody else avoided something bad. Or maybe you avoided something worse by having whatever it is bad happen to you. Um, and I found that for myself. Like, even the I thing. I'm like, I was pissed. I was absolutely yeah. So angry. I was in Vegas already. I was getting ready to make my dream fight. And people were like, she dropped out. She lied about an injury, like all this nonsense, you know. And that was really getting to me. I thought my life was over. It took like two weeks to find out, oh, you're going to be fine. <laughs> like, <laughs> and, um, but look at what my debut ended up being instead. Look at yeah. 
the card I got to debut on. Look at the time I had to prepare better. Look at the time I had to get my nutrition in line. The eight week notice I had instead of eight days, like everything ended up paying off great. Mm -hmm. And working out how it needed to. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, you had an amazing debut. I think you have a very bright future uh, in the UFC. I can't wait to watch your fights and uh, be like, I know her, you know, and that'll be pretty cool. So, um, you know, I have no doubt that you will get where you dream of being. Thank you. Um, and that will be at the top just because you, you know, the steps you have to take to get there and you have the drive. I mean, if you are so busy as you are and you can still go out and bust somebody's nose open, um, you know, I'd say that you're, you're, you're doing pretty good. Thank so, you. um, so I look forward, do you know when your next fight will be yet? Uh, not yet. My matchmaker is supposed to be finding me one. Hopefully it's, um, early to mid December, but who knows yet. Okay. So, what is your, do you know what your uh, Twitter and Instagram handles are? Yeah, best way to follow me is on Instagram at fear the maverick underscore H O M T. As long as you don't message me anything bad, I do my best to respond to you guys. Um, and then my Twitter is at fear the maverick. Pretty much. If you look up my name, Miranda Maverick, you're going to find me. Uh, I think I'm the only one of them out there. There are a couple fan pages, but it's pretty obvious which one's mine. Uh, Facebook is Miranda uh, quotes. Fear the quote again, Maverick, uh, go on there, follow my athlete page or even my personal page. Um, I, I usually post the same thing on both. Mm -hmm. So keep an eye out for me. I'm moving up the ranks. Get on my train while it's still early, you know. That's right. So if you're watching this, make sure to follow Miranda. You've heard the interview. She's amazing and uh, definitely up and coming. She will be a champion. She will have that belt one day. So. Um, you know, keep, keep an eye out for her. So thank you again so much, Miranda, for uh, being on the show. I really, really appreciate that. And uh, being my first non football. <laughs> I appreciate it. So again, this is Gina Moore with more than sports. Thanks for watching.